There we go. Okay. I think whenever you're ready to go, Natalie. Okay, good morning, afternoon, evening, depending where you're connecting from, and welcome to day two, upgrading to DSpace 7.4. We're excited to have you here with us. Um, and yep, so this is our schedule. We'll have a short introductions, the overview of the upgrade process, overview of new configurations, and a uh, half an hour for questions and answers and next slide i just wanted before we started um i wanted to take a moment here to remind the dspace community at large that dspace wouldn't be possible without your expertise and financial support dspace software is financially supported by the community via membership dues certified partners and service providers and various fundraising efforts Current pledges and campaigns are the DSpace Development Fund, the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, known as SCOS. And if you've been enjoying the benefits of working with this open source community and software product, please consider contributing to one of our fundraising campaigns in the coming year. You can read more about them and make your financial contribution or membership commitment via the fundraising section of the DSpace website and all those links are in the the slide here um it's we're seeing that it doesn't um the sound for the spanish interpretation is bad um so i'm not sure if enterprise it can help troubleshoot that Okay, so I'm gonna do some quick uh, pre presenter introductions. I'll start with myself. Um, my name is Natalie Bauer and I'm the program coordinator and I just started a couple months ago. So it's great to be here with such a big number of the DSpace community in these three days. So I'm so happy to be able to be working with you all. And then our two presenters uh, are, just going to my, Next here, Corrado Lombardi. Um, Corrado is a technology enthusiast born in Parma, Italy, where he lives uh, and he was born in 1982. He takes a proactive part in the analysis, design and development phases of the software life cycles, in particular for the DSpace and DSpace CRIS. Uh, he has been working for nearly 15 years for B2C wide traffic portals. These experiences gave him the opportunity to collaborate with established professionals who contributed to his professional growth and inspired him to give particular attention to the quality aspects of, of the software developed. He is a firm advocate of extreme programming. He adopts and recommends these practices to facilitate pro projects. He has an MSc in computer science and he obtained several technical certifications. He is deputy CTO at Four Science, a company he joined in 2020. And then we also have with us today, Tim Donahue, and Tim is the technical lead for the DSpace project. Uh, he coordinates community participation in the open source development process, including helping define the roadmap and organizing development meetings. He's been a DSpace committer since 2006 and joined the DSpace project team, previously at DoorSpace, in 2009. Tim has over 20 years of professional software development experience with over 15 of those years in the open source realm. Next slide. And today we're going to be handling questions and answers via a shared doc. Um, so Tim has put the URL there in the chat box so that you can access that document and make sure you put your questions in the section for today, because there are questions already in that doc from yesterday. So just make sure you're putting your questions at the end of the, there's already a few questions that people have put in ahead of time for today. Just make sure you're adding to that um, as we go. And if it's easier, you can also put questions in the chat and I'll go ahead and um, copy those over. And you can also write your questions in Spanish and we will translate them to English. So, great. Welcome. Okay, and now it's it's over to me. Thank you, Natalie. 
Um, and welcome everybody. One thing I did want to note at the very beginning here, I saw it run by through chat. The, the recording will be available to everybody after um, these presentations over these three days. Um, we're planning on getting them sent out um, hopefully later this week or early next week at the very latest. And the slide deck as well will be available to everybody. So you don't need to rush to try and uh, write down tons of notes or anything like that. You'll have the slides immediately at the end of the presentation. There's a link to the slide slides on the last slide of this presentation. Um, so I'm going to start us off here today talking about the upgrade process to DSpace 7. Um, and first off, like why you might want to upgrade to DSpace 7. And let me get my slides working. There we are. Um, so we have a, a top eight reasons to upgrade to DSpace 7. Um, and most of these, if you've looked at DSpace 7 so far, they might be somewhat familiar with you uh, or familiar to you. Uh, we have a brand new user interface that has enhanced privacy and aligns with uh, best practices for accessibility, um, a REST API that has every single feature of DSpace, um, support for best practices like OpenAir 4, as well as the core next generation repository repositories, uh, a new concept called configurable entities, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, as we're going along here today, but it allows you to store different types of objects within DSpace. Uh, you can upgrade from any version of DSpace, um, and we're also backwards compatible with your existing integration. So things that are integrated via OAI PMH or SWORD, or even the old REST API, those are all still available within DSpace 7. And finally, something that's really important to me at least um, is that every code change that we're going, that we're putting into DSpace 7 is automatically tested and it automatically is scanned for security vulnerabilities. So we're trying to make it very stable and very secure right away out of the box. And not only that, there are some exciting features in DSpace 7 that are not available in previous releases, not available in DSpace 6 or below. The first three I already mentioned on that previous slide, but we also I also want to stress some of these other features that you cannot find in any other DSpace release. Um, we support ORCID authentication now, and you can synchronize your ORCID profile with a local researcher profile in DSpace. That researcher profile uh, uses the person entity. So those two features do require enabling configurable entities if you wanted to utilize those. We now do have IIIF support. Uh, there's also a basic image and video viewer, which is separate from the IIIF support. So you can decide which one you want to use and that scenario based on your use cases. We support OpenID Connect authentication. A lot of the scripts that you used to have to run on the back end and the command line, you can now run directly from the admin user interface. So we're trying to bring more tools directly to your fingertips at the user interface level. Um, and we're also supporting a lot more import mechanisms. So you can import metadata directly from many different services um, into DSpace 7. And this is part of the submission process. It was shown off briefly yesterday um, in the using DSpace 7 uh, uh, presentation if you had a chance to attend that. And if you didn't, the slides will be available and video will be available soon enough as well. So moving along here, um, the 7.x uh, series has had already five different releases. So our first release was back in August of 2021, and we've been continually putting out a release every few months since then. We're now on a release schedule that is every four months, which means we do one release every three months. And the reason for this release schedule is to help get as many features out to you as possible in DSpace 7 and also to backport, or not so, sorry, not backport, forward port uh, features from DSpace 6 to DSpace 7. So we're trying to move features from DSpace 6 into 7 as quickly as possible so that we have a feature compatibility between old releases of DSpace and the DSpace 7 release. But this gives you an idea of all the features that have come into DSpace 7 over the last little over a year. Um, and right now we are working on these features here that are all old features that existed in DSpace 6 and they're all being moved over to the DSpace 7 framework. And these are due in February of 2023, so just in a couple months here. And we anticipate having hopefully all of these, but at least most of these will be in that release. Um, I'm not going to go through these in great detail, but these are all features that if you've used DSpace 6 or 5, um, these existed in all those older releases of DSpace. 
Um, and that release will also include other improvements and fixes um, and other possible minor features coming out of the community. When, when community members uh, give us new code, we try and get it out the door as quickly as possible. Um, and so if you're interested in taking a look at what's going on with 7.5, uh, there is a link there at the bottom of this slide uh, that brings you off to our, uh, our overall tiered plan list, our roadmap for DSpace 7, and what we're working on. It gives you more details about each of these features, including the tickets there. So that gives a, a quick overview of some of the reasons you might want to move to DSpace 7 and some of the features that you're going to see um, in those later releases. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's different about the DSpace 7 architecture uh, compared to DSpace 6, um, just to give you an understanding of, of the differences there. And then we'll go through uh, the upgrade process, what it looks like, what your options are, um, and starting to get into um, different tips and hints that we have for you here today. Um, but first, with the DSpace 7 architecture, um, if you've used DSpace before, this is a very high level view of what it looked like sort of in DSpace 6. Um, so in DSpace 6, you had a number of web applications. They were all separate WAR files or web application files that are highlighted here in the red dotted lines where you could decide which pieces you wanted to install of DSpace 6. And from the get-go, you had to choose a user interface. So you could choose either the JSP UI or the XML UI. And then there's various integration tools there through SWORD, OAI PMH, an old REST API, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's what you may be familiar with if you've used DSpace before. DSpace 7, the backend is similar in nature um, in terms of uh, uh, being able to uh, have the same features and functionality as in DSpace 6. Um, however, we've combined a lot of those tools into a single web application called the Server Web App. And that Server Web App includes not only the new REST API for DSpace 7, but it also includes those old integration tools. So the SWORD integration, the OAI PMH integration, and even the RDF integration. And we do allow you to also install separately that old REST API if you want it, if you need it for backwards compatibility. The bigger point here, though, is the back end is separate now from the front end. So the front end is a separate um, application that communicates with the back end. It's an Angular uh, application that uses Bootstrap for theming. Uh, it runs on Node.js, um, and it does search engine optimization via server-side rendering. And we'll see a little bit more of how that comes into play here as we're going through walking through the upgrade and installation process. But that's the basic idea here of the differences between those two platforms. I do want to stress here, though, that uh, the back end in terms of the database and the asset store and solar are all, all really the same in DSpace 7. The one difference is that solar does need to be installed separately uh, just because um, how solar changed their own application. We can no longer bundle it as part of DSpace. Um, so you do need to install that separately as part of the installation for DSpace 7. Um, I already mentioned these a uh, couple of these uh, briefly. The front end is themable uh, by a bootstrap designer. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible to, to theme through CSS and HTML. We'll go through a little bit of that uh, in tomorrow's workshop, uh, which goes through developing with DSpace 7. You'll see some examples of how to do a theme and how to do some basic theming. I mentioned that we're aligning with best practices for accessibility in the back end as that a single web application now. So a couple things you may want to do when you're preparing for a DSpace 7 upgrade, or a couple things you may want to consider. First off, I mentioned this, but I can't stress this enough. You can upgrade to DSpace 7 from any old version of DSpace. Your data is going to upgrade automatically when you upgrade your database uh, using the database script. Your files are automatically recognized as well. There's nothing you need to do um, other than run that upgrade script um, to up update from any old version of DSpace 7. If you are updating from an older version, though, you may want to consider starting with a fresh configuration on the back end because there were some major configuration changes in DSpace 6. If you haven't looked at those yet, you'll probably want to anticipate that during your upgrade process if you're coming from 4 or 5 or even earlier. I mean, I also do stress that if you're upgrading from a really old release, like three or four, you want to check the release notes for each version that you're jumping over, um, just in case um, 
uh, there are important updates there that, that may impact your local installation or things that you use. In planning your upgrade, um, it's important to note there's two ways you could do this upgrade. Um, and it, what you choose is really up to you. Um, there's pros and cons to each, and I'm gonna kind of walk you through each of these processes. But there is an option to upgrade in place where you can upgrade all your prerequisites on the same machine you're already on, upgrade that DSpace backend and install the DSpace frontend. There's also an option here to start completely fresh. Um, and this option I've actually found some people find a little bit easier with DSpace 7 because of the amount of changes in the user interface level, especially. Um, and in this option, you can just install DSpace 7 to begin with and migrate your data into it rather than worrying about doing that in-place migration. And I am gonna walk through both of these options um, at a high level for you today. And I'm going to start with that starting fresh option just because it really is about how do you install DSpace 7 um, and how do you migrate data into it. Um, and that installation instructions are in great detail in the wiki at the, at the link at the bottom here. I'm not going to go to that level of detail, but give you a little bit of a high level feel for how this um, installation process works. I would recommend uh, walking through the installation instructions, though, obviously, when you're doing this yourself. Uh, first off, when you're installing DSpace, I mentioned there's the back end and the front end. The back end installation is very similar to an old installation in DSpace 5 or 6. Um, you're using a lot of the same tools here. The process is extremely similar and will look very familiar to you if you've ever installed an old version of DSpace before. Um, so you, you need the basic prerequisites, you need a database in place, and you do need to install Solar now separately uh, because of changes in the Solar um, application itself. Once you have those basic in, um, prerequisites in place, you download uh, the backend code base or uh, download it from uh, GitHub. Um, you can configure your local configuration. At the very least, you'll want to configure what directory you're going to be installing into and some basic connection information to your database. Um, but all those details are in the in detailed instructions. You do a build and installation, which is very similar to how you did with DSpace 5 and 6. And the deploying it to Tomcat, very similar again to how it's done in DSpace 5 and 6. The one difference here from DSpace 5 and 6 over to 7 is in that you need to copy your DSpace Solar configuration over into your Solar instance. It's a quick copy and paste into Solar and rebooting Solar, but it is important to allow Solar to understand what information DSpace is going to be indexing within Solar, sending to it um, so that your search and browse works properly. Um, at the very end, once you start everything up, you'd be running on localhost by default. You'd have a URL like this um, running on port 8080 by default. And that server web app, as I mentioned, that single uh, web application would be running there. And so it's like the basic overview of what that back end looks like or how you'd install it. The front end um, is, a, is a brand new installation for all of you. If you haven't um, done this before, it is relatively easy, I will say, easier than installing the back end um, in terms of the number of things you need to put in place and how to configure it. You just download and install Node and Yarn, um, download our code base um, from GitHub, um, either the zip file or the code base from Git. Um, install the dependencies, which is a single command, that yarn install command that will install all the dependencies you need. Um, configure your configuration, which just allows you to specify, again, sort of your basic um, information about this installation, um, and then you build it and start it up. Uh, the build process takes a little bit of time. It'll take uh, somewhere between uh, five to 10 minutes, depending on the speed of your server. So it, it is worth noting that the build is compiling all that JavaScript together, minimizing things, make, getting it ready to go. Um, the startup is almost instantaneous. It's like a second or two. And there are two ways to start things. If you're just doing a, a very quick installation and running it, there's a yarn command for that. Um, we do recommend considering using PM2. It will make your lives a little bit easier when you're running in, in production. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we're going along here. But in the end, you end up with an application running on that port 4000 there on your local host. Once you have the back end and the front end in place, if you want to add that HTTPS production um, support control or a production installation does require HTTPS um, or secure uh, connection. 
If you want to add that secure connection easily, I'd recommend using either Apache or Nginx. Uh, there are other ways to do this, but I find that most sites using DSpace 7 um, find it the easiest just to install either Apache or Nginx and proxy everything through those. Um, it's a pretty simple setup. We have instructions for how to do it with a, Apache in our installation instructions. Um, Nginx is pretty easy, I'm told as well. I'm not as familiar with the installation there, but I would encourage folks who are familiar with that, we can add documentation there. Please send it our way. We can add some more information for, for um, others who may wanna use Nginx. But you install one of those two tools, and then you can proxy your requests into the back end or the front end where you can send any request to that backend server web app directly to Tomcat, send any other request to your user interface, and that allows you to use HTTPS very easily within Apache and Nginx, where you can install your HTTPS um, SSL certificate there very easily. You can set up your domain in Apache or Nginx and allow everything to run right through that. And it's important to note here that Notice that the URLs change for the back end and front end as soon as you sort of put this proxy in place. You don't have to change the fact that the back end is running on port 8080 or the front end is running on port 4000. You just proxy things through, which allows you to get that full HTTPS URL that you're gonna want in production. Um, so that's it at a very high level. There's more details, as I said, in the installation documentation, but this gives you an idea of one way you can easily uh, proxy your uh, commands right to the back end and front and allow them to, to communicate together. I mentioned this very briefly. Um, security is really a priority in DSpace 7. We're trying to keep your back end and your front end and your data very secure. That does mean that HTTPS is required in production. You have to run the backend at least in that secure mode. Um, it's not only required by DSpace, it's also gonna be forced by your web browser. There's not a way to get around this because DSpace depends on some web cookies and those cookies need to be sent securely. Um, so your web browser will block those secure cookies if you try to get around this. So you will need to do this in production. It is possible to run the uh, DSpace 7 app in just HTTP mode, as long as you're doing everything on your local machine. So developers do that all the time. If you're doing it all on your local machine, you can run everything on localhost and you're good to go. But as soon as you wanna bring this to a production application, you'll need to put it in that secure mode. Um, the backend also only trusts the UI by default. It has some cores and CSRF protection built into the system. And there is some hints here at the bottom for some common settings that you will kind of want to be aware of within the backend and the front end. Um, so in the backend and the front end, the rest settings tend to need to match up and they're going to be your full HTTPS URL um, based on um, uh, what you set up that URL to be. Um, on the back end, though, in the front end with the UI settings, they are going to often be different. So the back end needs to be aware of that full HTTPS URL for your user interface. But in the front end config, the UI section there is actually where your UI is running locally. And so that's often going to be a localhost URL. And it may say that it's localhost port 4000. And that's perfectly OK to be doing that in production. Because again, you have that proxy in front if you're setting it up through Apache or Nginx that allows you to proxy it to that full URL. Um, and this is something that often does trip people up. There are tons of information in the documentation about it. I'll mention some of the places to go for help later on here, but that's just something to be aware of. Once you have everything set up in that installation process, as I mentioned, you can easily migrate your data over. We have a installation documentation or, or migration documentation for this linked at the bottom uh, where you can find all the information about how to migrate your data from an old DSpace into a new one. These are the basic steps you would follow. You'd migrate the database, then the asset store. Um, you'd either migrate your configs or recreate them. If you're coming from a very old version, I'd recommend recreating them. If you're coming from DSpace 6, you might be able to just migrate them for the most part. 
Um, you'd update your database by running the database migrate command, uh, re-index everything, and then you can swap your domain over once you're ready to go. This does allow you to have minimal downtime if you want to do that. You can swap the domain over after the re-indexing has completed um, with everything to go. You would want to have um, some point in time where you're doing that migration, of course, and make your users aware not to be adding content during a period of time when your migration is taking place. But this is one way of going about that upgrade process. Um, the second way is doing that upgrade in place. This, these instructions are going to go a lot quicker because it's very similar to that installation um, process, but there are detailed documentation of that upgrade in place, um, again, in the wiki there at the bottom. Um, upgrading the back end, that's very similar to that installation of the back end. You basically just want to upgrade or install all your prerequisites, make sure they're all up to date um, based on what is required for DSpace 7, but it's very similar to, to in the past as well. Um, and this, these are those basic steps. These will look familiar to you if you've ever done an upgrade before with DSpace 5 or 6. It's basically going through and downloading that latest code, updating your configs, doing that build and update, running that database migrate script. The one thing to, that is different here, and Corrado will mention this again uh, later on as we're going through, is that there is a migration for the submission form XML. There used to be an old input forms XML file, which has now been uh, redefined in a new submission forms XML file in DSpace 7. Corrado will go through that in a lot more detail, but it's worth being aware of that the submission configuration changes here. And um, then you do the usual deployment to Tomcat. And as I'd mentioned about solar, in this case, you need to bring the solar configs over. The one thing to stress again is if you're doing this upgrade in place, there's no path to upgrade from the old XML UI or JSP UI. You need to adopt the new DSpace 7 user interface. There's no way to move forward from those old user interfaces. They've gone obsolete and they're not possible for us to migrate into the new platform. Um, instead, so you'll have to install the user interface like I went through already. So I do have some tips here. That's the overview of what that upgrade looks like, how to do it at a high level. Again, the documentation is your friend here, but these are some tips based on what some of the early adopters have learned along the way. People have done this before. Um, in terms of starting fresh for an up versus upgrade, I mentioned this already. Because the scale of the upgrade, there are some who have reported to us that they found that it's almost easier to start fresh. It might be a good opportunity to start fresh, get that DSpace 7 installation in place, get comfortable with DSpace 7 and how it works. I give it a, give you a chance to review and update your configuration if you need to have a configuration review, and then migrate that data over when you're ready to do that, that swap over. So some people found this a lot easier to, to approach than the in-place migration. So I'd recommend considering that as an option locally. Um, I mentioned I'd talk a little bit more about PM2. This is a new tool that is optional, but we do recommend it highly. It's a process manager for any Node.js apps. Um, the front end is a Node.js app. It's a JavaScript-based app built on Angular. The reason we do recommend considering this is that there's a cluster mode that you can run PM2 in that allows you to scale the user interface across multiple CPUs. This can really improve um, the performance of the server-side rendering, which is what is used for search engine optimization. And it's also that when you first hit the site, it's when that first page load happens. If you're seeing slowness there, you probably want to switch over to a cluster mode or some other tool like PM2 that can use this sort of clustering across CPUs. Um, so we have found this very useful for those performance reasons. If you don't want to use PM2, you don't have to. There are other tools that can do things similarly. We just recommend making sure that you have a way to similarly sort of scale the user interface for that server-side rendering for that first hit to the user interface. This is also a common question we've heard. Um, there's been some confusion about, can I run DSpace 7 in Docker? You can, and there are many sites that are already running DSpace 7 in Docker. We do have development 
Docker scripts in our code base. Uh, you can find those in the open source code base in both the front end and the back end. You're welcome to reuse or repurpose those scripts for your purposes. However, we don't recommend running them as is because they open up some ports that you probably don't want open up in production. They are used for development. So we open up ports to allow us to do more testing and development, to do some debugging and development, and you probably don't want those open in production. So we do not yet have those production quality Docker scripts. Um, I think someday we may, and I'd encourage if folks want to help us build those, uh, we do accept contributions from anybody. Um, and anywhere, we'd love that contribution. But it, as of right now, as of today, we have scripts that you, you can reuse, but you do want to take a close look at them and make sure you adapt them um, for your production scenarios. Um, another question, can I continue to use the Oracle database? If you haven't heard, Oracle support has been deprecated. It'll be ending next year, mid next year. Um, so we do not recommend upgrading with Oracle database in place. We recommend taking this opportunity to migrate over to Postgres if you have not already. Um, from our understanding, most people are on Postgres. I know there are still some Oracle users out there. Uh, so this probably does not impact many of you. But for those that does impact, there are options for how to do this migration. The easiest is probably to use our AIP backup and restore tool. However, however, be aware it cannot migrate in progress submissions. So you'd want to complete any of those first. Um, there is also an option to use the Aura to PG script, which is a third party tool, not something we built, um, but it's just a way to migrate from Oracle to Postgres in general. There is a link there in these slides of an example of one um, DSpace site that did use that successfully. So it is possible to do. You also can hire one of our service providers. I know they've done these migrations before. Uh, you can get in touch with one of them if you wanna just hire them just for this migration purpose. And finally, this is sort of my final little section here before I'm gonna hand it over to Corrado. There's a couple more slides here, but this comes up a lot. So I do wanna spend a few slides to talk about it. Do I need to use configurable entities? That is a big flashy new feature in DSpace 7. Um, if you're not very familiar with it, we did go through these slides yesterday um, and gave a little bit more of a demonstration of what configurable entities look like. Um, but it's worth noting just a couple highlights here that entities are new are a new type of item. They're still an item, but they're new type of item where you can actually define a specific type. They're completely optional, but they're kind of useful in that you can re define relationships between one entity and another entity. Um, and they don't replace items altogether. You can still use items um, and collections do need to be aware of entities. So usually a collection will accept either an entity type or an item type or a regular item. Um, we do have some out of the box entities. We showed these off a little bit more yesterday, but these are what are available out of the box. But the main question about should I use configurable entities, I do want to stress that entities are considered an advanced feature at this time. So there are some known limitations to them. They do not support AIPs, that AIP backup and, and, and restore process. They do not support that yet. There is not yet a bulk migration process from old DSpace 6 items into DSpace 7 entities. I think that will be coming at some point in the future, but it's not there yet. Um, and you really need to understand the relationship with a collection. You need to have a collection, at least one collection for each entity type that you wish to create in your system. And so one scenario where you might want to enable entities is if you need some of those new features I mentioned that do require entities, it is possible to enable entities and only use them for this ORCID synchronization with these local researcher profiles. That could be your own use case of entities initially until you get more comfortable with them or until you want to use them more. Um, or you may want to use them if those default entities that I showed briefly align well with the sort of data you want to add into your DSpace. But you may want to keep it disabled if you depend heavily on that AIP backup and restore process because they're not supported there yet. They will be supported in the future, but they're not there yet. Um, you also may want to keep it disabled if you're not really interested in being an early adopter, because again, these are an advanced feature. They work, but um, 
not all those tools and services are integrated into them like that AIP backup and restore and similar. And if this upgrade already looks really complex to you, I would highly recommend keeping them off for now. Um, I, I would not overly complicate your upgrade process. I know this is a big upgrade for folks. It's a big change to DSpace. Um, I would consider leaving them off initially during your upgrade. You can always enable them at a later time. They're very easy to enable later on as needed. And finally, if you go through this process and you get frustrated, you look like the face up there in that corner and you hit an issue, there are common issues that people are hitting during this upgrade or the installation. We've documented many of these in the common installation issues link at the bottom there. And these are some of them linked at, or mentioned at the top here where the UI spins, you get some weird errors that you don't understand, you can't log in. A lot of those scenarios are documented along with the solutions to them in that common installation issues link. Um, we also do have a troubleshoot and error page if you really can't figure out what's going on or you need to find the underlying error message. That's a great resource to allow you to understand where to find errors in DSpace 7. Sometimes the errors can appear more on the front end, sometimes they can appear more on the back end, and that guides you through how to find those error messages. And finally, if neither of those first two links help you out, there's the option there to ask for more help or support. That brings you right to our support options. The main places, of course, you may be well aware of. We have all of our um, uh, we have Slack. We also have all of our mailing lists um, available to you. Um, and there's also a Stack Overflow where you can ask questions there as well. And that wraps things up for me. So I'm going to hand things over here to Corrado, um, and he'll walk you through um, many of the new configurations in DSpace 7. So I was able to give you an update of or an overview of the upgrade and installation process. Now, Corrado is going to dig in a little bit deeper into some of the configurations you may want to more closely look at as you're doing this upgrade and installation of DSpace 7. So Corrado, if you want to take it away here. Okay, thank you very much, team. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. So, yes, as uh, Tim said, uh, now I'm going to share with you some uh, a bit deeper overview on uh, which are the uh, new configurations available in the Space 7 uh, systems. So, let's start from the uh, user interface uh, configuration, which, which are the already mentioned uh, config YAML file. Um, the space seven allows you to uh, provide a different uh, config YAML file depending on the uh, environment you will eventually want to run. So uh, now let's have a quick overview about the most common or the uh, part of the configuration file uh, uh, the space Chris adopt a uh, space adopter could. Uh, want to uh, edit the uh, one of the this section is the one who drives the uh, language selection the uh, language selector is the, is this uh, part you are seeing in the animation in the background allows you to define uh, which languages are enabled in your space 7 instance and how they should appear uh, the space comes with uh, a lot of languages it is up to uh, the Space 7 administrator or installer or adopter to decide which languages they want on their instance. Another useful, uh, uh, next slide, please. Another useful uh, configuration topic is uh, this part, uh, all under the home page YAML node. And uh, from here, it is possible to decide uh, how to, to, to drive the recent submission part, which is a component available in the Space 7 homepage, and uh, how many of the uh, top communities uh, level uh, adopters want to show in their the Space 7 homepage as well. Those are two components available out of the box in the Space uh, 7. So it is possible for what concerns the recent submission, it is possible to define the standard page size and also the step to be followed when load more button is clicked. 
and uh, which is the criteria on top of which uh, recent submission are uh, sorted. On the other side, for what concern, uh, sorry, <laughs> for what concern of the top community level, it is possible to, uh, since they are uh, listed in a paginated way, it is possible to define the page size. Go uh, next slide, please. Okay. The same applies. Another uh, property is the one driving the browse by option. It is possible to browse a repository content according to uh, several criteria. So uh, the, the last two uh, properties are common for all the uh, browser possibilities and they drive uh, whether or not uh, in uh, the browsing section, uh, this space should display the thumbnails of the items. And uh, since the browser uh, uh, pages are still paginated, it is possible with the page size attribute to define uh, how many how big should be a step uh, and how big are the uh, pages. Uh, in the particular case of uh, browsing uh, involving a date-based filter, it is also possible to define uh, how the uh, here, selection, here selection should be uh, populated. It is possible to define uh, how many years which, with uh, one here step uh, must be proposed into the select how many years with a five year step, you can see it in the uh, screenshot in the select, uh, here select screenshot from 2010 back, the step uh, back is five years, whereas from 2022 to 2011, the step is one year. And uh, we also uh, provide, uh, it is also possible to provide a default lower limit, which is the uh, lowest uh, here to be uh, displayed in the here select if uh, it is not this data could not be extracted from the repository content. Next slide, please. Okay. For what concerns the community list property, it is possible to define even there the page size, which means how many. Uh, how many communities should be displayed in their list and how big is the step when the show more button is clicked. Next one. This page seven provides a media viewer and it is up to the uh, administrator via the configuration file to decide whether or not the media viewer should be enabled. In the background GIF, we are seeing an example of uh, available when the video media viewer is enabled, so the property is set to true, and uh, these allow the space to uh, show uh, the video content, video attachments, uh, by means of this embedded video player. Something similar applies when uh, image viewer is uh, uh, enabled, meaning that uh, uh, attachments uh, image uh, attachments that are images are displayed in a kind of uh, gallery view view. Next, please. Okay, so uh, these were the, uh, let's say, the most common uh, properties uh, the Space 7 adopter could uh, want to, uh, might want to change. Jumping on the backend, the backend configuration files are all under the uh, config and config folder of uh, the Space and the Space uh, installation directory as well as its subdirectory modules. Next, please. So um, the uh, most common file, uh, configuration file, uh, you may want to uh, update or to change is the local CFG, which uh, has in the previous versions allows to override the, uh, the, the value of properties when defined also in other files. So the actual value which will be taken into account by the space seven will be the one defined in local CFG. These set of properties are the important backend configuration, aka as uh, the properties that if missing or misconfigured could uh, lead to an unexpected behavior of our the space seven instance. And they are the DSpace directory, which holds reference to the uh, folder where the backend application is installed. 
the display server URL, which holds the uh, actual URL of the backend application. On the counterpart, the display UI URL holds the URL to which uh, is exposed the front end application. All the uh, uh, properties, they are, if I'm not wrong, three uh, under the DB prefix are the one driving the access to the database. Whereas solar server must contain the URL of the solar system, uh, which will hold the indexed display seven data. And uh, uh, to properly deal with uh, course and CSRF protection, as I said uh, previously, by default, uh, uh, the backend allows connections just from uh, the display UI URL. It is, uh, uh, it is possible to allow other URL uh, to send requests to the backend. Our int is to uh, pay attention to which are the uh, allowed origins you want to set. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we said <clears throat> that uh, uh, this space 73 comes with uh, uh, new uh, sources from which it is possible to import metadata. And to properly have some of those sources uh, working, it is, uh, as a prerequisite, uh, it is uh, a properly key or properly API credentials are needed since all those uh, integration with external providers are, be, are built on top of API integration. So uh, if, uh, if you want to allow your Dispace 7 instance to properly deal and import uh, metadata from those sources, for some of, of them, ADS, APO, uh, CINI, Scopus, and Web of Science, you must provide and put into the local CFG file the proper key you have obtained from these, uh, uh, from these providers. Next, please. This is an example of where those keys are useful. Uh, the Dispace 7 user is allowed to query external system, which are the ones available in the uh, dropdown. And then what is happening here behind the scenes is that uh, one of those external system is being queried. And uh, once uh, results are available, the uh, submitter uh, is able to start a new submission starting from one of those uh, query result. And as said, to have uh, some of these uh, system the space seven is integrated with, it, it is uh, needed to have an API key, which could be set, uh, must be set into the uh, configuration file. We uh, suggest to put them into the uh, local CFG. Even, there, even if uh, there is a properly uh, configuration file driving and containing all the properties needed to uh, deal with these external providers. Next one, please. Okay. And this is what concerns the uh, basic uh, front end and back end configuration. Now, speaking about submission, let's have a look at how the uh, submission form uh, must be, could be, sorry, uh, configured. Uh, next, please. Okay, basically the uh, uh, submission is uh, uh, configured with uh, two files, item submission XML, as it was already in, uh, and it is something similar to what, what was in uh, previous uh, versions. And the other file we will see in, uh, in a while, uh, shortly is uh, submission forms XML. For what concern this uh, first file, it uh, still allows you to map submission, a particular submission to one of the collections. So if you want a particular submission flow for a collection, you can configure it in this XML file. And uh, uh, still it, it, her, here, uh, the uh, steps of composing a submission are still defined. As, uh, as a difference from the previous version, now each step uh, represents uh, the section, a section of a form which, which are displayed, the section in a kind of an accordion fashion. Each step may be 
mandatory or optional, and for each step, uh, each step holds a proper type, which uh, will be eventually reflected to a uh, different action taken during the uh, submission. Uh, next, please. So he, here a brief example of uh, how the uh, step and the submissions are defined. So uh, from the bottom, a uh, uh, submission could be is uh, could be defined uh, by with uh, by a series of uh, steps. Each step, as you can see in the screenshot, represent a part of the submission of the uh, submission, and uh, uh, those steps are defined in another node of the same XML file, which is the one reported above, uh, called step definition or held in step definitions node. Back to the accordion, as you can see, each step represents a section of the submission form. Um, the, uh, just as example, the collection step is uh, the step driving the component on top of this accordion, allowing the user to define in which collection the submission will be placed. Then we have uh, several steps uh, defining a part of the submission form. Uh, in this case, we have two uh, submission forms, uh, two steps representing a part of the form, basically a section where the date of the submission will be put, then an upload section allowing you to uh, attach items, and a license section allowing you to accept the deposit license. Next one. And uh, I think it is worth to mention that uh, uh, item submission defines some other optional step, which is, which are which uh, whose adoption in the submission is up to the need of your institution of your this space seven instance. Just to mention a couple, uh, we do allow the uh, submit. Uh, we do allow the selection, the setting of a Creative Commons based license with a proper step could, that could be added to a submission uh, process. And we also allow the, the submitter to uh, define the access conditions of the whole item by adding to the submission, if needed, this particular step, which uh, uh, will eventually be reflected and represented by this uh, item access condition part of the form, which allows a submitter to define the access policies to the, to the item they are going to submit. Next one, please. Okay. Now the other file needed to uh, properly define and draw a submission process is this submission form, which is uh, a replacement for what was called input forms XML in previous versions. And basically uh, in this file, all the uh, metadata fields that will, will eventually appear in uh, each submission form step are defined and listed here. Um, it is possible to uh, collect and to indicate in the same row uh, many metadata fields to be uh, filled in. And uh, it is possible uh, to uh, describe uh, uh, bit streams with a set of, meta of a configurable set of metadata. And this set of metadata uh, must be configured in this submission forms file. Next slide, please. So uh, the structure of this file is this one. Uh, within the form definitions, we have a list of forms, of form entries, which uh, reflects, represent a part of the submission form page. In, in this case, a part of the accordion we have seen earlier. Going deeper, next slide. Uh, for each uh, form, uh, one or many rows could be uh, set, and each row node represent, represents a row to be displayed within the uh, submission form. And this is all customizable. Now, the example we are seeing covers the customization of 
a particular step of the submission uh, process, which is uh, traditional page one, which is uh, a, a submission form step. Going deeper, and this is one of the uh, new aspects of the submission process in this space seven, it, uh, the, uh, it is possible to define uh, many fields in the same row because the uh, leaf, let's say, leaf uh, node of the row uh, of the row uh, component of the row node is the field. And for each node, as you can see in this example, it is possible to uh, collect uh, many metadata to uh, display many input fields to uh, hold metadata. Next slide, please. And uh, with this particular uh, bitstream metadata form, uh, the uh, submit the uh, the Space Seven administrator can configure which uh, metadata they want to uh, collect from the uh, from the panel the, defining the details of each bitstream. Next one, please. And. Uh, the structure of this uh, bitstream metadata form is uh, the same as uh, uh, is, is, is the same that we have in other kind of form used in the use and representing a, a submission step of the submission form. Next one, and yes, team anticipated it. Uh, the space seven does provide a uh, migration script. Uh, so um, there are uh, two options when it comes to configure the to configure or migrate the submission. It is possible to recreate it from the scratch by uh, manually setting those two files we have just seen, or it is possible to run the submission forms migrate script, which uh, need a couple of uh, which needs in input the path of the two source files coming from the previous version of the space and will automatically transform them in a format suitable for the space seven. Next one, please. Okay. Another important aspect of the space seven is the uh, workflow approval system, which could be configured as it was in previous versions with some uh, new aspects. So uh, the Space 7 uses the uh, configurable workflow uh, pattern, which was available since version 1.8 in the XML UI version. The default is the same three-step process. So the workflow composed by review, edit and review, and edit only steps. The uh, new aspect is that the workflow steps are uh, and the roles are all configurable and configured as Spring Beans, as uh, since the Space 7 is built using uh, Spring Framework in the workflow XML uh, file. And uh, yet the, it is possible to uh, configure the, a given workflow, a custom workflow for a given collection. Next one, please. So this is an example of uh, how the workflow XML file might look alike. We have been defining the whole workflow, in this case, the uh, default where the uh, steps composing the workflow are listed and the indication, the reference to which is its uh, first step. And uh, on the left, on the right side, we have a diagram representing this uh, uh, default workflow coming out of the box with this space seven. Next one, please. So uh, going deeper, uh, what is a, a workflow step? How, how what defined in workflow XML is reflected in the user interface? In this case, uh, we are uh, reporting a brief example of the review step configuration, which uh, for which is defined how the uh, the step, the task step is to be assigned if so, to uh, users and uh, uh, which actions are performed and most important, which are the users, which is the role representing the users allowed to perform this step. 
what will happen uh, on the front end part, each user uh, entitled to perform this step uh, among the workflow will see in, uh, in their uh, dashboard uh, the list of the task uh, from which they can uh, claim the task and perform the action according to the step they are uh, covering. Next one, please. Um, speaking about uh, the roles, the roles are all defined as uh, spring beans. And uh, uh, in this case, when, uh, uh, sorry, the um, defined roles are listed in the workflow XML file and uh, uh, the, uh, the path, the way to define which uh, to assign uh, these space seven users to those roles uh, could be uh, done uh, from the collection administration panel, which uh, allows the uh, space seven uh, administrators to uh, first create the group uh, whose users will be the ones performing uh, workflow steps, and then to add those users to the, uh, to the group. So uh, from one side in the workflow XML, we do define the roles, roles that are eventually mapped uh, in the collection administration panel. Uh, and, from, from, and from this point, the, uh, the administrators will have the possibility to add uh, users to to give to grant users uh, these uh, roles if needed, of course. Okay, that's it. Sorry, I went a bit longer than expected. Microphone back to you, Tim. No, you're actually right on time, Corrado. So at least according to my time. So thank you for going through the uh, new configurations there on both the front end and the back end. And as Corrado stressed, um, the biggest changes uh, in the configuration really on the back end are in that submission and the workflow configs. And um, there's tons of documentation, which we're linked to um, in the slides there as well, that you can read up on to understand um, the differences uh, between older versions of DSpace and DSpace 7. So I'm going to do a quick wrap up here before we open things up um, to questions from you all. Uh, I need to get control of my slides. There we are. Okay. So what's next for 7.x? So I, I already kind of talked about this, alluded to this earlier. We do have a release status page here at the bottom here that talks about every single 7.x release, what features are coming, what we're working on. Um, all that sort of information is available there. So I want to highlight that first off, that that's a great resource for you to go to if you want to know what's coming next. Um, but as I mentioned, and I, I talked about briefly beforehand, but I want to stress again, um, the goal of DSpace 7 is really about um, rapidly modernizing the platform of DSpace. So we are adding new features in every single 7.x release. I know this is different than in the past. It used to be that we'd only add new features in major releases. 7.x is, is different. It's about a rapid modernization of our framework, and it's a, a different sort of release that you need to be aware of. Um, and the reason why we're approaching it this way is that we're trying to add 6.x features into each release little by little. Uh, we could not re wait to do 7.0 until every single 6.x feature was in it. It would take really too long to get to that 7.0 platform. So we chose this approach specifically for DSpace 7 that we want to make sure that we are getting out features in every single release and releasing them as rapidly as we can to allow people to upgrade as soon as they are able to. Um, as if necessary, there are times that coder factors may occur in these releases, but we're trying to minimize those and we will document them in the upgrade processes when they occur. Um, but as I noted before, we're on a three releases per year schedule. Um, we sort of standardized in the last year on February, June, and October. I anticipate that staying the same in, in 2023. So um, we will have 7.5 in February, 7.6 in June. 7.7 would be around October. Um, as soon as 7.x is feature compatible though with 6.x, that is when we're gonna start talking about what comes next in DSpace 8. 
Um, at this point in time, and this is the latest and greatest news, it does look like we are getting close to feature compatibility, and it may occur either after 7.6 or 7.7. .7. So by mid next year, um, expect to have some some sort of general announcement about what's going on with eight, even if it's just that we're starting the planning for eight and what's coming next. So DSpace 7 do, is getting close to that level of having all the features of six. Um, again, all the information is down there um, in the in the um, link at the bottom in terms of the goals for seven and and our timelines and all that. Um, I do also want to note that there are pla places that you can contribute. DSpace is an open source project. We are doing our best to move rapidly with the team that we have, with the um, donations and funding that we have that Natalie mentioned, but we also could use people at times, ideas at times. So we do have a development team. If you're a developer and you're interested in adding in a small feature, fixing a small bug, anything and everything is welcome, as small or as big as you want to give your time. Uh, we do meet every Thursday. You're not required to even attend those meetings. If you just want to send a small bug our way, we'll take a look at it and we'll help get reviewers. Um, we also welcome anybody to help us test pull requests from other developers. So if there's a bug that's annoying you and somebody else fixes it and you find the fix out there on GitHub, give it a test. Let us know if it works for you. That helps us move it along more quickly. Um, if you're not as technical, um, there's opportunities for repository managers also to gather um, in the DSpace community advisory team meetings. They meet monthly and their next one is coming up in December. And they provide a lot of feedback to the development team and to governance about next steps for DSpace. Uh, the development team also asks them questions sometimes about features, what, what's important in a feature, what's, what are use cases, things of that nature. So if you're interested in that sort of work or just talking with others who use DSpace, join those DCAT meetings. And now I think it's time for us to go ahead and open things up for questions. Um, as I mentioned and promised, the work sides, workshop slides um, for this slide deck are here immediately. Um, Natalie, if you're able to copy that into the chat, if not, I can do that here as we're going through um, uh, questions here in a second. But you can go to this tiny URL. The first one there is these workshop slides, so you can get them right away. Um, and we do have that public Q&A document there where we will be answering questions now for the next 25 minutes or so. Um, and Natalie is going to help me work through those. Um, and I will anything we don't answer today, uh, I will work to get answers for you in that document. So you can keep an eye on that document and we will uh, get the answers for you there and links to information for you for any question you may have because we're trying to get all your questions answered. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and open up to questions. Natalie, do you want to help me uh, comb through our giant list of questions here? <laughs> yeah. Um, one second. I translated the ones that people put in there um, from Spanish into English, and then um, the the peop a lot of folks put stuff in the chat, so those are all here now. Um, and I think that, um, I think I missed a few that were in Spanish, but <laughs> some of these, um, I think that people, one of the general things that kind of was um, coming up a lot was this, can you migrate from DSpace CRIS to 7.4 or is that even the same thing? And um, so those were some of like the, the main questions at the okay. end that people had. So I don't know if you want to start with that. Sure, I can start with the DSpace Chris question. So DSpace Chris and DSpace are separate products. Um, it's worth stressing. Um, so Corrado can probably answer more on the DSpace Chris side because uh, DSpace Chris comes out of the Four Science team. Um, it is built on top of DSpace, but it is not something that um, I'm involved with directly. I'm the DSpace tech lead, and Corrado and the Force Science team help out with DSpace Chris. I do, before we talk about that more, though, I do want to note that there is discussions in our um, steering and governance on ways to bring DSpace and DSpace Chris closer together to try and maybe even make it one single product. Because essentially, what happened back in the past is that um, Force Science noticed that we need an open source sort of Chris system for those of those people who need Chris systems, and they use DSpace to build on top of that to build that DSpace Chris system immediately as soon as they saw that use case and need. Um, and now we're coming to a place where with DSpace 7. 
seven entities and DSpace Chris, the, the two ideas are starting to come closer and closer together. Um, and I hope at one, one day they will become one system in itself and we'll find a way, way forward together. Um, but as of uh, this moment, they are two separate systems. So if you have DSpace Chris, you are running a separate system from DSpace. Um, they are very similar but it is, it is a separate system. And so Corrado, I don't know if you wanted to answer that in terms of, is there a migration path from an old version of DSpace Chris over to DSpace 7? Is that possible to do, or are you more sticking with DSpace Chris for now? Uh, sorry, uh, the question was migrating from DSpace uh, 6 to DSpace Chris or from DSpace Chris to DSpace Chris? Um, I heard DSpace Chris 6 to okay. DSpace 7. So Chris to D space. Chris to Chris. Uh, well, uh, it, so far uh, it is uh, it is not uh, possible or, or better not uh, whole automatically possible. Uh, it is uh, it is something that requires uh, for sure uh, some uh, kind of manual ad adaptation. So. Uh, it is a process uh, not yet 100% automatic. Okay, but I, I I do know that there is a DSpace Chris 7. So if you're on DSpace Chris 6, you could migrate to DSpace Chris 7 and DSpace yes. Chris 7 is built on top of DSpace 7. So that's one option. Yes, this is possible. The, yeah. the migration from DSpace Chris 6 to DSpace Chris 7 is uh, absolutely possible. Okay. So yeah, I would recommend for folks who have questions about DSpace Chris, get in touch with the four science team since they lead the efforts there. Um, uh, I, I would not be able to help you as much um, with that uh, particular question, unfortunately, but it is a good question to note that those are two separate systems and understanding the differences between them. Um, I also see um, in the chat recently, and then there are a few questions in the document relating to cybersecurity. So are there any updates to um, people say that they're facing cyber cybersecurity issues and IT teams are raising concerns? How is that being considered? And then there was another one. Um, are there any improvements for the 7.x versions? Um, will there be a modern monitoring similar to new Relic? to allow the managers of repositories to learn when the service is down or under possible malicious attacks? Um, so I'll start with the security aspect. I mentioned already um, briefly um, that every single uh, code change that goes into DSpace 7, and this is different from DSpace 6 entirely, every single code change that goes into DSpace 7 goes through a security scan. We use an automated security scanner. Um, right now it's a tool called lgtm.com, but we're migrating over to GitHub's own internal security scanning capabilities, which is replacing that. Um, so all the code within DSpace goes through a security scan. We also receive the um, security uh, notices and notifications for whenever something we use, a tool we use has a security loophole and we patch those as quickly as possible. We analyze them first. Um, and then patch them in the next release and have actually released um, quick patch releases um, in, in extreme scenarios. So like when the log4j um, uh, breach occurred, there was a quick release of, uh, I don't remember if it was 7.2, it might've been a 7.2, there was a 7.2.1 to patch that immediately so folks could be up to date as quickly as possible. So with DSpace 7, we are monitoring security very, very seriously. And we do have those tools in place to try and keep things as safe and, and secure as possible at all times. Um, so if there are specific questions about specific security vulnerabilities or questions or things like that, um, we do have an email address that you can email, which is security. I'll type it in the chat here, security at dspace.org. This automatically will email myself and all active DSpace committers. So if you have a specific question, it's a private email address. So it will not go to everybody in the public. If you see an issue that you're concerned about, um, if you want feedback on it before making anything public, um, if you're concerned about something, you can email us at security at dspace.org. We'll analyze it and get back to you, um, let you know. Um, and um, basically, that, that's the answer to in terms of the, the security and how we're monitoring security. But I do welcome feedback on that from anybody who does have feedback, send it my way. 
Um, as for questions about New Relic, um, that's a tool that's external to DSpace. I think some people do use it. I don't know enough information about what an integration with New Relic looks like for DSpace. So um, if it's as easy as configuring New Relic for DSpace, there might be others who have fam familiarity with New Relic um, in terms of being able to monitor your site. I do know there are a ton of monitoring tools out there that can do different levels of monitoring. Um, and I do encourage people to use those in production, but I don't tend to, we don't tend to recommend any sort of specific monitoring tool in the DSpace installation or upgrade procedures, just because that often is a local need and based on what you use locally. Um, but if folks do find um, that there's usefulness and if there's something we need to add to DSpace to make it more compatible to, to New Relic or other tools, uh, let us know. You can create a, a ticket and GitHub, or you can even send us code. If there's a small change you know that would make it useful, more useful for monitoring, um, let us know what that is and we will gladly uh, review it and try and get it into the next release. But those are good questions. Um, this person that just asked in the chat about um, production environment, there's also a bunch of questions in the document related to that. So I'll just go ahead and ask that okay. you, uh, what is the ideal server requirements? And someone asked specifically for Linux, um, back end and front end on the same server or each in different servers. So there's a couple questions around that same that topic. So yeah, you have a lot of options in terms of whether you um, uh, whether you want to uh, install the front end and back end on the same server or on separate servers, or you can use Docker as I mentioned to do different containers for them. Any of those are completely. Um, available to you. And it's really kind of a local decision, to be honest, of whether you want to run them on the same server or separate servers. You can do the front end and the back end on the same or on separate. It really does not matter um, in terms of the behavior of DSpace. If they are on the same server, you probably do need to have a pretty powerful server in terms of um, memory and CPUs. We have some rough performance tuning guidelines on that and some rough um, recommendations on this link that I'm sending out to everybody right now. Uh, there's a performance stream page on DSpace for that has some tips for DSpace 7 already. Um, we are working on um, improving this constantly. So as we get feedback from uh, users of DSpace 7, people using it in production, things they found useful, um, this gets updated um, on a regular basis. So if you have feedback you want to add into this or suggestions, if you've already started your upgrade or once you've started your upgrade, I welcome sending those suggestions my way. Um, basically, this is a page that allows us to um, gather that feedback together and provide recommendations. And that feedback right now is mostly out of early adopters for DSpace 7 out of the um, people on the development team who host their own DSpace 7 instance already, things that they've found. Um, and as I said, they, we will update it as we go, but that's where the latest recommendations are. Um, I did see also a question here about a Linux installation package. I will admit there that um, I don't have enough um, I don't have enough knowledge about what it takes to build a Linux installation package for uh, for a web application like DSpace. DSpace, I think the challenge there would be making it still configurable and customizable, which we hear DSpace users want a lot. Um, so if there are people out there who know who have good examples of a Linux installation package um, and ways that we that are there's an installation package that's similar in some way to DSpace, that's something we could consider. We haven't considered that in the past because we find that there is a number of operating systems that people want to run DSpace on. And because of those uh, need for high level configuration or, or not high level, very detailed configuration, as well as uh, detailed customization, including theming, branding, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we tend to lean more towards that Docker approach of we have some Docker scripts to allow you to spin things up quickly. Uh, you can build off of those and and um, and utilize those um, for production as you may, may want to. Um, I did see a question in chat here about, can you migrate directly from DSpace 5 to DSpace 7? Yes, you do not need to go through DSpace 6. 
You can even migrate directly from four to seven or three to seven. You don't need to go to through all those versions in between, but I do recommend that you read the release notes for all those versions in between, because sometimes there are significant changes that will impact you during the upgrade. So for that DSpace five to, to seven jump, you need to be aware that in DSpace six, the, the configuration changed significantly to use a local CFG file. That same configuration is in place in DSpace 7. So you can make that jump, but you need to understand what changes happen in DSpace 6 to the configuration because you'll see those same changes in DSpace 7. Um, Tim, there is a question sure. about um, the support tickets. Could you just talk a little bit, a little, uh, a bit more about that, like how people can submit, a, um, you know, a bug or a support or something like that? Sure. Um, let me bring it up in my browser here. Since I'm sharing my other screen here, I'm going to pull this over. Um, okay, so all of our tickets are in GitHub these days. Uh, so the um, we have two GitHub repositories, one for the front end and back end. Where you submit a ticket really doesn't matter. Um, to me or to anyone else, we can move it around as needed. But generally speaking, um, there's issue pages. So the Angular, DSpace, if I can spell today, um, there's an Angular issues section for Angular issues, and there's a DSpace issues section for the backend issues. You can add tickets into here with a GitHub account. You can create a new issue. When creating an issue, you have an option of submitting either a bug report or a feature request, or you can even report a security vulnerability, which will send us to send you to email us about that. Um, so this is how you would report an issue. You can send it in either place. Um, when you're reporting something that's like a bug report, it will ask you information about describing the bug. We need information about how to reproduce it. Um, and you can add additional details as, as well. So that allows us to better reproduce the bug so we can fix it quicker. Um, if you're asking for a feature request, it's a different sort of form. So it's why is this feature important to you? Um, describe what the solution might look like. Describe other things or workarounds you might have considered. Um, and that allows us to gather some of the basic use cases um, to allow us to get more information about that. Um, I do want to stress, though, that um, creating tickets is a wonderful way to give us feedback, but, um, but uh, it is a um, open source product. We also do welcome people to uh, to do development themselves and send it our way that the more people involved in the code, the quicker we're able to move, the more bugs we're able to fix, all that sort of stuff. Um, so if you are, um, if you're finding a bug and you have a developer on staff and that developer has time to look into it and finds a fix, send both the ticket and the fix our way. And that helps us move quickly and get that fix in. Same with the feature. If there's a feature you've built locally that you think that others would really find useful, um, you could create a ticket around that feature to describe why, how you use that feature, maybe provide a screenshot and then send us the code um, as well. And we can take a look at that and try and get that in. So that's ways to help us move more rapidly. But you are still, if you don't have developers on staff, you can create those tickets. We'll analyze them and prioritize them. Um, the way we work is, um, while we're talking about this, is we have our own set of project boards um, in our in our DSpace repository. These are linked from that uh, status page that I that I provided you earlier about finding the status of of 7.x releases. But right now we're working on a 7.5 project board. Um, and we have developers claiming things and working on things on that board. We have things that are already in the review stage, so they either need reviewers assigned or they're in the review process. We're testing, reviewing them. People can also jump in and help out on this board. Um, this is where we're, you, we do a lot of work in our meetings, in our developer meetings, but you're welcome to contribute outside of those meetings. If you're not able to join us in a meeting, you could review something that's in our under review column. Tell us what you think. You could look at our to do column and claim something there if you want wanted to work on something. And this is also where bug new bug tickets may appear. If you create a bug ticket for us and we are able to reproduce it quickly, I'll immediately pull it over to this to-do list on our board, see if I can find a volunteer, see if we can get it in the next release. Um, and the link to that <laughs> yeah, is right here. It's also available, as I mentioned, on the 7.x status page that I linked in the slides. So that's another way to get Go ahead. Yeah, the Google group for technical support. Um, is that also a good um, thing to share here, Tim? 
I can just yeah, share the link. generally we have a support page, um, which was linked earlier in the slides under need help. Uh, if you need support, we have a support page on our wiki. Um, there is the tech support group that Natalie linked. There's a support page here that provides you every single support option um, based on what type of support you need. Um, some of them may lead you to the documentation. Uh, often you're led to that uh, Google group that Natalie linked into, but there's also um, uh, information about how to get um, uh, the training workshop materials we link into here. We also have information about if you want to hire somebody to customize your DSpace, how to find the registered service providers, how to report security vulnerabilities. This is sort of a catch all for any sort of type of support you may want to get um, out of DSpace. And let's see if there's any other. We got a couple more minutes, about six more minutes here I'm seeing. Trying to see, I see a lot of thank yous and um, yeah, I see a question about, will all the questions that cannot be answered today be answered in writing? Yes, they will. They will be answered on, let me get this out of the way, this questions doc here at the bottom of this slide. Um, please, if your question has not made it into that question doc, if we missed it, there was a lot of chat flying by. If we missed your question in the chat, um, add it into that questions doc, and I will make sure it does get an answer there. Uh, keep in mind, um, after yesterday's session, there was 80 questions. So it's going to take me some time to comb through all of these. Um, I will get to it, I promise. It may uh, not be in the next day or even this week, um, but hopefully in the next week or so here, um, or by the end of November, I will get to it um, shortly enough um, to help answer those questions. But I will make sure everything gets answered there. Um, let's see. Oh, it says uh, the question here about just to make sure the embedded media feature for for default for 7.x versions. Yes, the embedded media viewer that you saw is in all 7.x versions since I think 7.2 maybe. Um, it's it's uh, default disabled, but it's very easy to enable. Corrado noted that um, you set a flag to true and that turns on the video viewer. And there's also an image viewer there as well. Um, so that is enabled um, or possible to enable very quickly and rapidly um, in DSpace 7 um, if you need that. And I see we've got about five minutes left. I'm frantically trying to see if there's any other quick things yeah. to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, looks like I'm seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat. Um, the recording will be available uh, later this week, likely, or early next week. The, the recording along with the slides for all three presentations um, will be available to everybody. And it will be publicly posted also on our uh, wiki. And I think there may be an, and even be like some tweets and blog posts about it as well. So you will get the video um, and all the materials that we have here. If there are any other quick questions, you can try and add them in um, chat. Don't you ever sleep, Tim? Yes, I sleep. <laughs> I also have two kids. I wonder that too. <laughs> I have two kids. I work hard, but yeah, but I do take breaks. And and that said, actually, for those of you looking for questions for me, I realized I'm off next week for the Thanksgiving holiday. So I'll get as much done this week as I can. Um, I will get other, other things answered after the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, for local fields, could they be easily migrated to newer versions? Yes, the metadata framework is the same um, in DSpace 7 as it has been in the past. Um, so if you've added those local metadata fields in old versions of DSpace, they should migrate over automatically into DSpace 7. You shouldn't have any issues there. Okay. Well, thank you all for, um, for your participation today. Um, I see, I saw it at one point in time, we had up to about 450 people in here, which has been wonderful to see that much um, interest in the upgrade process. I'm um, seeing a lot of thank yous um, in the chat. So just wanna say thank you back to you all. Um, 
And uh, as Natalie mentioned, um, if you're finding these useful, please do consider trying to become a supporter of DSpace, uh, have your institution become a member, uh, help us out through code. Uh, there's also the DSpace Development Fund, which was mentioned earlier in the slides, that can help it, that helps us do quicker development on DSpace 7 and help us fund some of that development. So those are ways you can really help us out to make DSpace even better. But we appreciate all your support um, and, and um, all your time today as well. And I think we're probably ready now to, to go ahead and wrap up. It looks like we're seeing lots of thanks um, in the chat. So thank you. And thanks to Corrado as well for, for help. Um, and thanks to you for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to join this uh, webinar. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Muchisimas gracias. Hasta mañana. And Natalie, if you can stop the, the video, that'd be great as well. Thank you all. And join us tomorrow if you're in.